Okay, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you for joining us today for our um, latest webinar, Understanding DNS, a Business Manager's Perspective. Um, this uh, webinar will be tackling the challenging topic of, of taking up what is essentially a very technical piece of uh, internet infrastructure, uh, which is the domain name system, and explaining it in a way that makes sense in a business context. We expect the webinar to take about 40 minutes, and in it we'll having a look at the nature of DNS and how it can be used to, to uh, provide very useful threat and also business intelligence. Um, just a bit of housekeeping. Um, if you've got any questions, please type them into the chat window uh, on your right, and our speakers will respond to them at the end of the presentation uh, if time permits. And after the presentation, uh, we'll be sending a link to all participants so that you can view your presentation again or indeed share it with colleagues and friends. Um, I'd like to kick off by uh, introducing your speakers today. Um, first of all, it's uh, Tom Webb, who is the head of Centronic Registry um, uh, Products. Uh, Tom is the group product manager for brand services and uh, joined Centronic after being a head of product for uh, the big corporate domain name registrars, NetNames and CSC Global. Tom has over 13 years of experience as a senior product manager and extensive experience in the domain names, brand protection and DNS security uh, services. Uh, also joining us today is Tim Zach, uh, who is the Director of Sales Engineering at Newstar. And Tim has been helping customers build and secure their enterprise networks for over 20 years. He's been running the sales engineering team at Newstar for the last three and a half years, and he takes particular interest in providing customer insights into the threats targeting their networks. And I will be uh, chairing this session. My name's Andy Churley. I'm the head of marketing for uh, Centralic Brand Services. And uh, I've been working in the domain name industry for uh, over 15 years and have held uh, a number of uh, marketing and product roles in registry operators and registrars. Um, and in product roles, I've developed online registrar and registry systems um, for a number of companies, including brand protection systems, as well as uh, DNS infrastructure. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to hand over to our first presenter, Tom. Um, during uh, Tom's presentation, both Tim and I will um, switch our cameras off and let the focus be on uh, uh, Tom himself. And uh, we look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Andy. Um, hi, everyone. So as Andy mentioned, I am the Group Product Manager for uh, Brand Services at Centronic. My job today is to uh, try and explain in a simple way what DNS is. Um, and I'm going to take you through that. Also talk a bit about some of the threats that can be um, targeted at your DNS system and why it's really important that you have a robust DNS solution as part of your internet infrastructure. So uh, let's just jump into it. Um, so at a very basic level, um, every computer or, or device, internet connected device connected to the internet has an address. You might have heard of this before, an IP address. Um, be that your laptop, your mobile phone or your web services that you're serving to your customers. Now, the IP address you can think of as like a telephone number. Um, without it, you can't communicate between the two devices. So a, web, a laptop can't connect to a website unless it knows this IP address. Now, hopefully most of you know, uh, are internet users and know that you don't actually use these IP addresses uh, in your day-to-day -day usage. That's because they're very hard to remember. Um, but that has been solved on the internet um, and we have uh, the domain names and the domain name system. Um, so you can register a domain name, which is a human readable and easy to remember address. Um, and then the domain name system takes on the heavy loading of translating those domain names into IP addresses so that you can find the web services that you want to get to. So you can think of the domain name system in a very simple way as a very large distributed phone book. Um, you need to go to the internet and look it up on the on in the phone but where you're trying to get to so uh, here is an example on the screen at the moment centralnick.com uh, translates to that ip address 
And if you want to try it out, just type it into your web, web address bar and you'll find yourself landing on the Central NIC website. So let me take you through how this kind of works at a, at a very high level. So let's take a, a user of yours who types into their browser shop.acmelimited.com. Now, the user and their computer have absolutely no idea where that IP, where that web service is. It doesn't have the IP address yet. So the first thing that it has to do is it has to go off and ask the DNS system for the IP address. So it goes off and gets that address. That is responded to the computer. And now your user has the address. It can go on and connect to that web service. So the DNS system there is taking the request, translating it into an IP address, and allowing the computer to connect to the web service. Um, Hopefully you can see that this means that DNS is incredibly important because if something should happen to your DNS service or your DNS system, then you might as well not be on the internet because if you can't translate the domain names to IP addresses, then no one will find you on the internet. Um, also, the DNS system is part of how people find your web services. So it's really important that the DNS system is fast and responsive uh, so that your users don't get unnecessary delays in finding where you are. You can have the most you know, powerful and fast web services, but if your DNS is poor, then people are gonna get a poor experience connecting to you. Now, as I said, this is a very high level and basic overview of how the DNS works. It's a little bit more complicated than that. Um, what typically happens when you're trying to connect to a website is that you go through a number of different lookups. So your users, when they try and connect to a website, they have to find everything from the very beginning. So the very first request seen here in, in orange when you want to find a website is you have to go and ask the root of the internet, known as the root name servers. They will tell you where, in this example, where the .com registry's name servers are. The computer then has to connect to them and they'll ask the .com registry, can you tell me where uh, the configuration, the, the name server for Acme Limited is? And then you are translated to number three, which is that name server that then responds the request. And you can find in number four, the web service. Now, the DNS in green there is all completely under your control. You can either run it yourself or you can outsource that to a partner who will run that for you on your behalf. Given the critical nature of the, of the domain name system, um, it's really important that you have a, a robust and um, uh, appropriate DNS solution for your website. So hopefully that gives you an overview of how uh, the DNS works in, a, in terms that you can uh, hopefully understand. What I want to now talk about is given that the importance of DNS plays within the internet infrastructure, um, how that can then be uh, maliciously interfered with. So given the criticality of DNS infrastructure, it is subjected to malicious actors trying to disrupt it. There are two typical types of attacks that are taking place. They'll either be availability attacks, so trying to stop the DNS system from working for you, or there are things like integrity attacks, which is trying to disrupt what is being responded to, i.e. interrupt and, and change the responses coming from the DNS system. Uh, so I'm just going to explain a couple of those. Some of these terms you might have heard before, but hopefully I'll give you a context of what they are and how, how they can affect your business online. So uh, an availability attack, the typical one you might have heard of is a DDoS. Now DDoS stands for Distributed Denial of Service, and it, it's exactly what it sounds like. The objective of a DDoS attack is to deny the service of, of the DNS system. So they're trying to take your DNS system offline. Now under normal operation, the DNS server will be getting lots of requests in, all valid traffic, and be responding happily to all of those requests, and your users will be finding your website and connecting to that. Under a DDoS scenario, what a malicious user tries to do is flood the domain name system with millions of queries um, with the objective of taking out that DNS server. Um, now, this will happen in one of two ways. Either it sends so many requests that the domain name, uh, domain name server takes so long to respond to that that the valid queries coming in just get down the bottom of the queue and take ages to be responded to. So it'll take people longer to connect to your websites. Or if they're successful and get a lot of traffic through, uh, they can crash those DNS servers. And by doing that, they effectively take those DNS servers offline 
and no one can connect to your website. Uh, now, some people do this for fun. There are people who like to do DDoS attacks for a, for a bit of fun, but there are other more malicious reasons for doing this, either to hide other types of attacks or just take you offline um, through uh, some kind of uh, threat to you and your business. Now, there are ways you can, you can protect yourself against this. Um, one of them is to make sure that the provider of your DNS system has DDoS protection in front of their DNS servers and or has a huge capacity. Because if you can create a huge amount of capacity to respond to more queries than a malicious user can send to you, your service will always be online. Um, the second protection you can do is you can have a globally distributed Anycast network. An Anycast network is really, it's a number of servers distributed over the world, all under the same banner. Um, and this gives you two advantages. One, there's a lot more servers, and therefore you get a huge amount of capacity delivered through that. But secondly, um, any attack um, will have their uh, have the queries uh, sent to the nearest location. Um, that means that only a subset of your users may be affected because it'll be limited to the region within which they're in. And thirdly, you want to make sure you're partnered with someone who has or, or you're providing 24-7 monitoring and DNS expertise. You really need to, the people to know their stuff about mitigating against these types of attacks and protecting your DNS network. The second types of attack, which are, uh, are quite worrying as well, are integrity attacks, such as DNS spoofing. Uh, in this type of attack, what the malicious user is trying to do is trying to change the response coming from the DNS servers so that they can redirect your users to some malicious third party site or server. So in the example I gave earlier, what the malicious user will try to do is either take over your DNS infrastructure or get in the middle of it and start responding with different addresses to the one that would have been responded to if it hadn't been infected. This means either all of your traffic or a subset of your traffic might be sent to a different web server. From this, the malicious user may try and uh, replicate your website and put some malware on it try and steal credentials or do other things that are nefarious. Now, this is a very difficult one to detect, especially if they only take a proportion of your traffic, um, or it might be obvious if they divert all of your traffic. Um, but it's, it's really important that you're able to protect against these types of attacks too, uh, because they will impact your users uh, disproportionately uh, than other types of attacks. Again, there are some ways to protect yourselves against integrity attacks. Um, one of them is uh, DNS security, also given the, the acronym DNSSEC. Um, this creates a chain of trust between the responses coming from the DNS server so that your browser knows if someone has in, interfered with the chain of trust. So if someone tries to sit in the middle of it, it will create an error and your browser will detect that and will show an appropriate warning to your users. Um, the second protection you can do is uh, seemingly uh, uh, strange to DNS, but it's have an, app, an SSL certificate on your websites. SSL certificates make sure that the server that is serving the information is trusted. So if they divert your traffic to a server that isn't your server, um, the browsers will throw up a big red warning. And you may have seen some of those when you've been navigating on the internet. And thirdly, you want to make sure your DNS provider has a lot of threat intelligence behind uh, their DNS systems to be able to proactively detect these types of attacks and be able to uh, deal with them through a proactive uh, campaign against those threats. Now, this has real world consequences and some research done by some independent uh, uh, consortium found that 79% of uh, uh, online businesses have experienced some kind of attack to their DNS system. And of those that are attacked, there's an average of nine and a half attacks per year. Um, and these have a real world consequence on your revenues because any traffic that is uh, deviated away or stopped from uh, getting to your web services has a monetary impact on your on your businesses. And that can be up to $924,000 per attack. In addition, 82% of the respondents had said that they had some kind of downtime due to DNS on their web services. So it's really important that the DNS part of your infrastructure is really taken seriously. Um, so what do you want? So with all of this information, um, uh, there, are, there are five key things that you want from your DNS. So the first thing is you really want to make sure that you have a high query volume capacity. So you want to partner with someone who has um, a lot of servers 
uh, hopefully in a in a Anycast network that allow you to deal with a lot of queries coming in. Secondly, you want to have fast responses. You don't want your DNS getting in, in the way of the user experience for your customers. Therefore, you need to make sure that it is uh, fast at responding to those queries that come in. You want it always to be available and robust. So that means you want to make sure you have the protections against a lot of these things that I mentioned earlier. And therefore, you want it to be secure. It's really important that the people who have access to your DNS are only those authorized to, to manage it. And you want to make sure that it's maintainable. Now, all of those things are, are really important, and that's why we're very proud at Centralnic to be partnering with Newstar, one of the format um, uh, suppliers of DNS services. And I'm now going to hand over to Tim, who is going to take you through what Newstar do and how they support Centralnic in their threat intelligence. So over to you now, Tim. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Tom. That was a great overview of DNS and also some of the threats that are out there uh, that you need to protect yourself from. So that's one of the things that I wanted to talk about today is can you use the information from DNS to help find new and emerging threats that are out there? Can you protect your network using information from DNS? Uh, so as you explained, Tom, since you need to use DNS to do just about anything online, people have been wondering, can we use this data to find new and emerging threats? Because even the bad guys need to use DNS to have uh, their communications work. Uh, DNS has long been used for forensics. For example, uh, the Seoul, uh, the uh, Olympics, 2018 Olympics in South Korea were uh, attacked uh, and basically they were able to link the attack to the state-sponsored Russian hacker group Sandworm via DNS records. Uh, so the DNS has been used long for forensic purposes, but we need to understand, can we use DNS data for more forward-looking, uh, to more forward-looking threats, new and emerging threats? Uh, one, there's been several academic papers that were written a few years ago that uh, basically said, through by looking at lots of DNS data, we are able to find some potential patterns to see new and emerging threats, but it really was an academic exercise. There wasn't a lot that enterprises could do with it because there was just so much data, it just couldn't all be analyzed. Then came the rise of the machines. So basically over the last few years with some of the improvements in machine learning, we've found we've actually been able to use machine learning to find some of these emerging threats using DNS data. And you know, what can we use this for? So basically the DNS data, you already have a lot of threat defenses. The DNS, the threat intelligence that comes from DNS data can comp uh, complement those. And we'll talk about how it does that in a little bit as we go through here. One of the other, one of the things we can do here is we can add unique data to better inform security. Uh, that's one of the interesting things is that DNS th uh, threat feed uh, by gathering different views, you can have multiple DNS threat feeds as well as add this to your existing data and you can see new and unique sets of data. Uh, of course, there's gonna be some overlap as DNS data is public and seen from various servers as it goes through the DNS tree, tree as Tom explained, but gathering DNS data from different sources will provide you a richer view of the landscape. Uh, other things that we can do with DNS data is it reduces that mean time to detection. One of the things that is been a metric for a long time is how soon can you find a breach that has happened in your network and then put a stop to it. Uh, that number has been coming down, but sadly, still around 25% of breaches take months to detect. So one of the things we can use is DNS data to bring that gap down so you can realize that there's been a, pro there's a problem and stop a problem even before it happens. So let's talk about some of the use cases that we have here. So the first use case is uh, phishing. Uh, and according to the Verizon Data Breach Investigation Report, that is the most common cause of data breaches. And if you're not familiar with what phishing is, uh, I'll talk about it a little bit here. This is where a user at your enterprise or your company receives an email that looks like it's from a legitimate source, uh, from a trusted provider, but in reality, it's not. You can see 
down over here, there's something that says click here to proceed. You can basically change this URL to make it say whatever you want. And you it may say, you know, at your trusted website here, it may say click here to proceed. But when a user clicks on that, what happens is, as Tom said, basically something is spoofing here. It's going out and going to a uh, malicious website, something that is not your own. And what happens there is once the user uh, goes to that malicious web page, they enter their credentials and the, the credentials are harvested. And now the uh, bad guys have some login parameters they can use to go compromise the real website or worse, uh, in the case of business email compromise, perhaps uh, the email looks like it com it's coming from your CFO and they've asked somebody to help set up a new partner and to wire some money over there. Well, if that happens, the money is gone. Uh, you may think, well, doesn't my uh, IT department already protect us from phishing, things like that? You know, there are the multiple defenses that happen today. Uh, many people have secure email gateways that filter the email through first to look for things that are malicious. Uh, user education, I know at Newstar, we have to certify, go through security training once a year, and uh, every few months, our IT department will send fake phishing emails out to us to see if anybody takes the bait. Uh, and I'm sure that's probably something that many of you also do. Um, we are also getting a lot of times, many other customers, as I said, are getting threat feeds from others, not necessarily DNS threat feeds, but threat feeds of known malicious uh, IP addresses and domains out there. However, there is a time gap uh, between when something is known as uh, something comes online and it shows up in a threat feed. And we call those golden hours. There's basically 16 or so hours between the start of a phishing campaign and when they first show up as in the first threat feeds are being flagged as malicious by existing defenses. And this is really the most dangerous part of the time frame for a phishing campaign and when the most users are caught up in the web. So what can, how can DNS data help protect you against phishing? So one of the things, uh, one other security provider out there did a survey and found that up to 70% of newly observed domains are uh, either malicious or not suitable for work. So if you have a DNS threat feed that tells you, hey, here are some new domains. This domain was just became active within the last hour and it's a near real time threat feed. You can actually help protect your enterprise from these new and emerging threats. Basically, you take the view of guilty until proven innocent, that uh, no one, if it's a brand new domain, you should not be going there until your other threat defenses can catch up with it. So the idea here is to take some of the information out of this newly observed threat feed, put it into your infrastructure and prevent users from going there for a day or two. And then once that has passed and your existing defenses have caught up, then you can remove the DNS, uh, the information received from the DNS thread feeds from your infrastructure. This is actually a use case of what happened earlier this year. Uh, this was a mobile provider in the UK, and they were particularly nefarious about this because it was sent to a mobile phone, which makes it a little bit harder to see uh, exactly where you're going to when you click on a link. If you look here, it says, hey, there's a problem with your payment, can you click on here to update your information? And it looks fairly legit from here. You see ee.co.uk, and then there's the rest of this, but usually that just takes you to a certain page on the application. Well, really, if you look, there is a dot between uh, UK and billing. And what that means is actually billing-update-january2nd.info is actually another domain that was registered. So if the user clicked on this link, they would be going to a completely different and spoofed site uh, for that mobile provider. So how can you help realize what, what's going on here? Well, for this particular case, we went back in and saw this particularly malicious domain was actually activated uh, the day before uh, on January 2nd, uh, before this news article came out. So you can see here that by using a DNS int, uh, threat intel feed, uh, we can help protect your enterprises from newly observed and malicious domains. 
there's another thing out there called a DNS twist. And a twist is just a variation on a known uh, domain URL. For example, I'm a really awful typist. So many times I'll put an S instead of an A for Facebook. And basically the bad guys are going out there and registering a lot of domains with those lookalikes, uh, lookalike domains. So that if someone mistypes, they go to some place that looks like Facebook, but really isn't, and they can harvest user credentials that way. Uh, so basically, there's a lot of things that we can do. A DNS threat feed can help you find, uh, monitor these twists, and help protect your users from malicious activities. So there was a use case here that happened with a large financial services provider. Uh, basically, uh, they had one of the one of their twists, something that looked like their name became active. Uh, when we looked at it, we found that uh, the domain spoof looked exactly like the company's website, and it was even more malicious because if the uh, user that was investigating the website had an internal cookie, it would just redirect them to the main real website and everything would be just fine. But if the user didn't have that cookie, they would go to a malicious website where malware was downloaded with the intent of compromising that end user. Uh, further research that we did into this domain was that we found that this twist was associated with an IP address that was uh, associated with other malicious infrastructure and malicious domains. So because of this, the financial company was able to go to the registrar, say, hey, this is a uh, name that's trying to spoof us. It's using IP addresses that are associated with other malicious activity. And they were able to take that website down. Uh, another use case here uh, that can be you can use DNS threat feeds for is uh, fraud. Uh, as is the case in the U.S., as with many companies, there was a two trillion dollar program in the U.S. to help provide relief for businesses from the effects of COVID-19. Uh, the bad guys saw this and they came up, they said, ooh, free money from the government. I'm just gonna create a fake company. I'm gonna spin up a website, make myself look legit, and I'm gonna submit my form to the government and I'm just going to sit back and collect my money and pocket it. But uh, there are a couple different things that we can do to help figure out, are these uh, requests actually legitimate? By looking at uh, a DNS, Thread feed, we can figure out, hey, how long has this website been up? Is it new? Uh, is this, this company started in the last week? Wait a minute, let's take another look at this. So what you can do is use information from DNS to go back and figure out, do we need to take a second look at this application to help prevent fraud? Um, before we get into some of the next applications, need to talk a little bit about how malware is distributed out there. And you may have heard about this, uh, things called botnets. And basically botnets are networks, uh, networks of uh, compromised computers or Internet of Things devices. You know, your doorbells, your smart speakers, your refrigerators, uh, anything that is connected to the Internet uh, that you don't necessarily interact with day in, day out. Uh, a lot of these uh, Internet of Things devices can be compromised. Uh, things have gotten a lot better over the last several years by adding additional security to these. But uh, a, a while back, there were known vulnerabilities to some of these Internet of Things devices that bad guys exploit to be able to take them over. Uh, and what what we've been able to do is they're, they're still out there. Things have gotten better but we are uh, still trying to figure out how to best stop these. Now, one of the ways these uh, infected machines talk and get information, uh, get their directions from their uh, creators is they work through something called command and control servers. And as Tom mentioned, uh, everything uses DNS on the internet. So these uh, infected devices have to look up uh, the DNS name of their command and control server. Um, because uh, it's very easy to stop a single domain lookup or IP address, what the uh, 
malware creators have done is they've created something called domain generation algorithms, which cycle through hundreds or thousands of different lookups, the DNS lookups that they use to connect to their command and control servers. Because of that, this domain generation algorithm, it makes it very difficult for the uh, for us to stop them because we never know what domain or what uh, IP address these zombies are going to be talking to. So these uh, it makes it very difficult to put a stop to them. So we have to try and figure out what's going on with these domain generation algorithms. So if your DNS thread feed provider actually has a DNS a domain generation algorithm thread feed, that actually takes all the work out of it for you, makes it very easy to stop this. So basically by taking a look at the DNS data and looking at uh, the frequency of requests and uh, the domains resolved, we can find out which domains are likely domain generation algorithms. And honestly, this is never something you wanna see coming out of your enterprise. If you see an endpoint in your enterprise talking to something uh, over a domain that is identified as a domain generation algorithm, that is really bad. You wanna stop that. So uh, basically you wanna, if you see that, what you'll do is you will go and find that user make sure their machine is cleaned up, take a look, make sure that the, the malware has not spread around your company and take a look at that. But the first step really is to block this uh, domain that has been identified by the DGAs. So again, simply put to help protect your enterprise, you can, simply put to help protect your enterprise, you can, take these domain generation algorithms and put that into your existing defenses so that your enterprise will should not communicate with these. There's another nefarious technique called DNS tunneling. And this came out of the fact that DNS, uh, to be able to do a DNS lookup, your infrastructure needs to allow DNS lookups back and forth through all your security infrastructure. And the bad guys are taking advantage of that going, oh, they're just gonna let DNS lookups go through. So bad guys have realized, hey, if I can make my traffic look like a DNS lookup, the end user is just gonna pass that through and I'm gonna be able to get a lot of information in and out. So what does this lead to? People, uh, the bad guys can use DNS tunneling for data exfiltration. So if, they have, if they've gotten a hold of your network, they can actually look around and take some of your uh, intellectual property out as well as customer lists, et cetera. Uh, you know, gives them access to your internal network. Uh, so basically that can be a jumping off point to go taking a look around and seeing what's happening in your network, as well as use the using DNS tunneling for malware command and control. So again, this is another way DNS information, DNS threat feeds can help us by providing a DNS tunneling feed. Basically, these are domains that are known to be exfiltrating data uh, using a DNS tunnel. Again, this is something that you'll want to put into your infrastructure, stop these domains and block them. And honestly, you always want uh, on any of these thread feeds, you want to want a partner that updates their data frequently in near real time if possible. And finally, one last threat uh, talks about domain hijacking. Uh, Tom again alluded to this previously, uh, being able to take control of your domain and actually redirecting your traffic not to the legitimate web server, but to something malicious, a lookalike where they can harvest your credentials. Uh, so, you know, one of the things that we do that, that way, the ways this can happen is you could target your registrar or DNS service with social engineering or with credentials that have uh, happened through a phishing campaign or another malware attack. Uh, and, and you may be wondering, well, oh, can, can this happen? I mean, my IT guys are pretty good. I don't think that uh, they're not going to fall for anything. They're not. They're not going to give up their credentials to their registrar so that we can, you know, uh, make changes to my DNS infrastructure. Uh, but actually, it has happened, and it has happened to some very uh, uh, high-level organizations that you would think that this wouldn't have happened. So there was a DNS espionage campaign 
that hit a global provider of DNS services, as well as a nonprofit that manages DNS infrastructure for top level domains. And also there was a, a, a hacker group called Sea Turtle that compromised at least one national top level domain. And there's a lot at stake here when this happens. So if you lose control of your domain, uh, your reputation can go away because people can, uh, that the bad guys can start redirecting your traffic to malicious servers. And eventually if things get bad enough, your domains can end up on blacklist because they are, they're now seen as uh, hotbeds of malicious activity. Uh, you know, and again, this happened in real life. There was a bank that uh, one of their domains was hijacked and they took the main banking website, moved it to something malicious and the users entered their credentials into the malicious uh, lookalike website. And then the bad guys took those same credentials, went to the bank and cleaned the end user's account out. So again, very bad things can happen here uh, if your uh, credentials and your domains get compromised. So how can, how can DNS data stop this? Well, you want to look for a, a threat feed service that provides domain updates and, and have you made any changes to your name server? You also want to see, hey, is for some reason my website now being directed to a new IP address? And obviously you want these feeds to be in near real time so you could see this information quite quickly. And uh, it's also a best practice, as uh, we want to say, to uh, set up a DNS monitor that will tell you if your name servers or key DNS records have changed so you can be alerted to this in as, as soon as you possibly can and be able to take action and stop any of the problems that, that, may, be, that may come from this redirection. So uh, that's really about it. In summary, uh, a partner with the right DNS data can uh, help you provide uh, different insights, additional insights that you may already have to your security infrastructure that helps you protect against a broad range of malicious activity, including fraud, phishing, uh, data exfiltration, uh, domain takeover, and, and really at the end of the day is protecting your brand and your networks. Uh, so that's it for now. And Andy, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Tom, for a very interesting presentation. Um, we've had a few questions come in. Um, I'm just taking a look at the time. Yeah, we have time to answer a few of these. Um, so, I mean, it, it's really important, I think, the message that we've got through um, today, first of all, is that uh, DNS attacks are real-world attacks, are not just theoretical, and that they can cost, as Tom uh, showed us, um, just under a, uh, an average of a million dollars per attack. Um, and again, if you put that in, in the context of um, our favorite um, provider, which is always Amazon, because it sends uh, packages all around the world. Amazon makes, off of its main website, it makes around half a million dollars per second. So you can imagine the, um, the impact, the financial impact that just a few minutes uh, outage could cause um, through something like a DNS attack. And, and as Tim and Tom have explained, you know, DNS is integral to the underlying infrastructure of the of the internet. You cannot use the internet effectively without it. Um, and so just moving on to the, the questions, Tim, we, we've had a, um, uh, a data protection question actually come in. Uh, and that question is, is the DNS GDPR or is DNS data GDR, GDPR compliant? Short answer is yes. Uh, DNS data is is public data. It's out there. It's it's unencrypted, and uh, there's no uh, you know personal personally identifiable information uh, available in the uh, broad range of DNS data that's out there. Thank you. So so we're nice and safe in that uh, our data is uh, GDPR compliant, and we're not going to be personally identified. That's great. And then Tom. Um, can I control my own DNS infrastructure? Uh, yes, you can. Uh, the internet is a is an open place, so if you really want to run your own DNS servers, you can you can create that for yourself. I think the the main question is to ask yourself why you might want to do that. 
um, because uh, there'll be a significant amount of um, of infrastructure cost to be able to do that at a level that is is sufficient for your business, but also then having to protect it and have the in-house expertise to do all that is again is is a is a challenge. Um, but there's absolutely no reason why you couldn't. It's just asking yourself whether you should and whether you have the the expertise and capability to do that yourself. So I guess this is in in a, in a way parallels um, the domain name system in the fact that you can operate your own top level domain um, in the same way as .com operates .com. You could have your own infrastructure uh, that could operate, you know, .tom for example. Uh, the question then comes in, you know, is it a cost effective uh, measure for you to do? Uh, are you best equipped to? handle things yourself or is it better to outsource this um, this activity to to a third party that's a specialist in that and, and the two things I think kind of go hand in hand yes it's perfectly possible to operate your own top level domain um, and it's perfectly possible to operate your own DNS infrastructure the question is can you do it as well as those organizations that are set up specifically to do that and that's why I think we see Many certainly, let's say the top, um, the top organisations on the, um, other in the stock exchange will all outsource their DNS infrastructure to a third party provider who can do it better. Um, uh, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And so back back to Tim. Um, we've had a question in about um, again about DNS data, and it says, "Can DNS data provide me with early warnings of potential attacks?" So there, there's a couple different ways to do that. As I, as I talk through in the presentation, uh, there are multiple feeds that can give you indications if you are under attack or have even potentially been compromised. Things like the uh, domain generation algorithm feed. So you know, wait a minute, my one of my systems is communicating with something that's known malicious. That's a red flag right there. The same with the DNS tunneling feed. Wait a minute, data may be going out in an unauthorized fashion. In, under this, uh, to this domain that is identified as using DNS tunneling. Uh, also, as I mentioned before, many new domains, the majority of new domains are not suitable for work or known malicious. So if you can have a near real time feed of that and provide the information on where those domains are and prevent your employees from going there, that will absolutely keep you much safer. Thank you, Tim. And then uh, final question that we've had in uh, today. Uh, so I'll, I'll uh, spread the load out evenly. So I'll, I'll, I'll uh, ask Tom this one. How much does it typically cost to run a DNS infrastructure in-house? Uh, well, that's a tough question. Uh, well, it's, it's kind of like the how long is a piece of string. It really depends on what kind of infrastructure you want to be running. I mean, if you chose to run your own one, it, it can be as simple as just running a few ser servers in your data center with the appropriate open source DNS software stack. Um, but you'll get what you kind of pay for at that cheap level. Um, you're not going to get much protection against the threats that we've been discussing today. Um, so to, to put in a robust DNS system, you're going to need probably a distributed network of servers. Um, you're going to need some, some experienced uh, network operators to run that. Um, and that can start racking up a lot of cost. So running those dedicated data centers, running those servers, keeping it patched, keeping it all online. So that can run into the hundreds of thousands of dollars per year. Um, and it comes back to the previous question I answered, is, is that within your core competencies and something that you want to be running? Um, and are there economies of scales and, and better services out there that might be able to provide that to you with all of that experience and the dedication? Um, uh, with no difference in, in the, the level of security that you might get across that. Um, so, yeah, it can range from a few a few tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands. Um, but if you want to do something decent, you're probably going to be looking at the, the hundreds of thousands uh, in terms of running that yourself. And I guess the, the, the trade-off there is that you have to provision and um, operate your own infrastructure irrespective of the number of queries or domains that you may have on, on zones that you have on the, that infrastructure. Whereas if you outsource to a third third party, you're essentially paying for what you use and no more than that on, on shared infrastructure. Yeah, and, and also the scalability of a third party service as well. So um, that that is all got built in scalability, whereas you will have to scale uh, as and be monitoring that yourself. So 
um, if you became much more popular or you, uh, for, for whatever other reason that a lot more traffic comes to you, you have the headache of having to expand that. Whereas if you're using a third party provider, they're all set up to expand because they have the networks there and they're, they're serving the large numbers of customers already. Excellent. So thank you very much. Um, I noticed that we are slightly over time now. Um, so we'll draw things to a close now. I'd like to thank uh, Tim from Newstar and Tom from Centralic uh, and Brand, Brand Shelter uh, for their time today and for a really insightful and interesting webinar. Uh, thank you all for attending and we hope to see you early in the new year for our next one, which we'll post online fairly shortly. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.